Um, I don't know what our last numbers are, but, but as of sometime Sunday, we were up to 6,400 people downloading the, uh, the programs this month. And uh, that's awesome. Amen. We, we're going to see it get bigger and bigger. Can you say amen to that? <clears throat> Hallelujah. As we, we uh, you know, good things are happening now on Roku. Now we won't be able to, ch- I don't guess we'll be able to see how, who, how many look at it on Roku, can you? Yeah, I'm checking every day. Uh, earlier today we'd added another 300 households. Okay, but actually how many people watch a program on Roku? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't see, you can't track that. That's all in our statistics. Though. Huh? That's in our general statistics. Anything that's viewed on Roku gets counted as Okay. Okay, but so if something gets downloaded on Roku, that goes into our stats. Okay. All right. We basically don't have anything we can't get stats off of. Okay. Great. Do this separate and cut them separately, but everything else. Okay. But but Roku gets loaded into it. It's pulled off of Roku. That's what it is. Roku pulls it off of our site. Got it. Okay. So we're, we're, we're hitting it up. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we told you Sunday night. We were going to do on Sunday night. We kind of got talking about uh, some different things on Sunday night. So let's get in here. Uh, being overcomers, triumphing through faith. We are born to be overcomers. Look at 1 John chapter 5. We're going to get just go ahead and jump in here and get through here. If you weren't with us Sunday morning, I encourage you to go back and listen. Uh, on Roku, on YouTube, on um, iTunes, on our iPod cast, our video cast. Uh, from the website, however you want to do it, and whatever works for you, go for it. Amen. Hallelujah. We want you to be involved in seeing what's going on. When you're not here, um, uh, remember this. If you're out of town, you can't be here. You can watch us online uh, within, what, a couple hours after our services. We're not streaming live yet. I, I wish we were uh, located within North State's boundaries. We could get 30-30 uh, symmetrical. We could we could pop it out there in a hurry. And actually, for about $10 a month, we could go 30-80, which is really cool. Um, we, could, we, could, we could smoke it up there. and uh, But we just don't have enough bandwidth here to, to stream. Um, it takes more equipment and more stuff to stream it. So we just don't have it. And it will cost us a lot of money with uh, Time Warner. They, actually, they won't even come here. Time Warner won't come here. I think we're on um, AT&T. Um, and we're on um, DSL. Yeah, Time Warner won't even do us unless we do a $700 a month package. Well, anyway. Hallelujah. For, but you know, we encourage you, and also on our website, if, you, if you're traveling and you're going to be gone for a while, you can, you can go to our um, online contributions tab and use your credit card and use PayPal and uh, do that. Also, if you're at the church and you, you don't bring cash or check with you, we have the ability to go ahead and receive your offering with Square. And uh, that'll go into our account, and a couple of days later, we put it, it'll be transferred over to our main account. Hallelujah. We, we keep it in a separate account to protect us from hackers, uh, online hackers. All righty, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this know we that we love the children of God. Uh, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he then that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Hallelujah. Uh, Psalm 41, 11, that we say on Sunday is, By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy does not triumph over me. Now, as we said, Sunday morning we, we were more inspirational about the fact that God causes you to overcome, that we're winners, that we can, that we can win through Jesus Christ. But let's, let's begin to look at uh, why, not just because we're born of God, but what's, what lies underneath uh, our ability to overcome. Look at John 16, 33. John 16, 33. We really better back up now just, just a little bit. You know, Jesus is about to leave the disciples and go to the cross and be separated from them. And uh, in verse 31, he says, do, do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. In other words, there's, peril, there's, a, peril, there's a perilous time coming. Something's about to happen. These things have I spoken unto you, that you might have peace. 
in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So Jesus tells us that even in the world there's going to be, tribu there'll be perilous or tribulation times, times of tribulation, of difficulty, but be of good cheer. Even though you're in the world, he says, I've overcome the world. So though you're in the world, remember the scripture says this, though we're in the world, you're not of the world. Amen. And so uh, Jesus tells us that we can be of good cheer. Why? Because he has overcome the world. So the, the underlying, beginning of the underlying foundation of our ability to overcome the world and be overcomers is that Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. Which leads us to 1 John chapter 4 verse 4. We did quote this on Sunday. We'll, we'll do it again tonight. 1 John 4 4. John writing to the church as he does throughout the entire letter of 1 John. Yes. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. I'm sorry, that's 1 John 5 4. I'm back. We just already read that, didn't we? 1 John 4, 4, 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who? Well, if you back up, you find that's talking about the spirit of Antichrist. Okay? Because, now here, now Jesus said, or not Jesus, but John says, the reason you've overcome them is because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. All right. Well, John 17 and then 1 John 4, we find out that though we're in the world, the chapter, the 17th chapter of uh, John's gospel, Jesus talks to the, to the disciples in his, this, this is such a wonderful passage of scripture because it is his, as you might want to say, his farewell address. Okay. But we find here, from reading throughout this chapter, we find that though we're in the world, we're not of it. So though we're in the world, we are not of the world. Jesus prays for the church to come, that, um, that we may be one with him even as he's with the Father. And he goes on verse 23 of John 17, I and them and thou and me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And so we find here, you know, that, you know, um, we're of the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. And so we need to understand that because God is in us and the greater one is in us. Now, the greater one's ability to produce victory in us is based on the fact that what? Jesus overcame the world. We can appropriate or act on that. Let me say something now. Some people want to um, relay the idea that you're automatically overcome without doing anything. The just shall live by faith. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, if you just read 1 John 4, 4 and didn't read the rest of it, you go, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he than you send you, than he is in the world. But John didn't quit writing. He went on and wrote more. And then when he gets to the fifth chapter, uh, he says that, the vic that our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And so the, the, these, are, these are whole concepts and thoughts. And, and to be a good student of the Bible, you just can't pluck out a scripture and run off with it. You have to take it in within the entire context of what's being said. And the other things that are said that may, that bring balance or clarity to what was said. Okay? The fact that in 1 John 4, 4 says, ye have overcome, then in 1 John 5, 4, he says that, that what we overcome for with is that our faith tells me that there is an active part of the believer in applying the victory that has been provided for us. Amen. And so let's not get flaky. Everybody say flaky. Don't want to be, God don't like flaky Christians. He loves you, but he don't, he don't like flaky, he don't like flakiness. Amen. 
Hallelujah. So, um, we understand that Jesus pro procured our, our victory. The Holy Ghost on the inside of us is greater than the one that's in the world. Our faith in God is what makes it applicable or real in our lives. Now let's look over in Romans chapter 8. Uh, let's just back up then. Um, we'll just run in here and jump in verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? You have to read the rest of the, the, the preceding chapter to understand all that we've talked about, all the specifics of what he's talking about. The answer to all of the things that Paul was presenting there is this. If God be for us, who can be against us? It's time we get a revelation of that. God's on our side, we win. If you take advantage of his being on your side. Now, you can be a bozo and say, no, Lord, I got this one. No, let him take it. Amen? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, we understand within context, the all things is what? All things that pertain to life and God, that's all things that the Word of God promises us. You don't get all things. You can't have somebody else's wife. The Bible tells you you can't. You just can't run off the deep end with stuff. You have to take it within the context of the, of, of the actual letter, the context of the, of the chapter or the, or the paragraph that it's written within. Then you have to expand it beyond that to the letter. Then you expand that beyond to the New Testament doctrine and then to the whole Bible. You have to, it all has to be done contextually so that you properly understand it. He'll give us all things that relate to, to life and godliness that, that, are, that are in within the view of what God desires for us. He's not going to give you somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife. I'm sorry. Yeah, tough. All right. <coughs> then he goes on and says this, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now let me say something here. He says he didn't, he did not say he would not condemn. Didn't say that God would not lay something at your charge. Now, the fact that it is God that just that the justifier who can lay something that, uh, against you, it is Christ who, who intercedes for us, who can condemn us, that means you're in good hands if you mess up. Because God will always judge justly and Jesus will always pray for you. Amen? And besides this, this is not talking about all people, it's talking about God's elect. So the, the people outside the covenants of God, the, you know, some people want to say, oh, everybody's sins are forgiven. Nobody, nobody, nobody is guilty before God. Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. The Bible says that people's names will be blotted out. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? And whosoever name was not blotted out. What do you mean? When Jesus died on the cross, God wrote everybody's name in. Those who die without Christ have their name blotted out. God loves people. I mean, he wants to bring them in. He's, he's made every provision to bring people in and strives with man by his spirit to bring them in. But if they fully reject that and die in that state, their name's blotted out. But thank God while we're living and we're, and we're walking with God, we're doing the best we know to do if we make a mistake. The one that can lay something against us is the one who justifies us. The one who could condemn us is interceding for us. Well, I, I'm glad to know that. Because I know some folks, I don't want them, I don't want them to be in charge of, of uh, laying something against me or condemning me. Hello. Because they just ain't nice about it. I, I know, you know, anyway, I'm not even going to go over there. I'll get myself in trouble. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now look. Paul asked a rhetorical question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. No one. Distress, persecution, tribulation, famine, nakedness, peril, sword cannot separate us from the love of Christ. God, Jesus loves you no matter what. Do you know he loves people who die and go to hell? 
That's why he went to the cross and shed his blood. So they wouldn't have to. But there are people, you, know, you got obstinate, hard-nosed people out there. I mean, you'll see some of the most vile, vitriol aimed at Christians and God from people if you don't agree with their whacked out positions in life. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, becomes disgustingly evil. But he still loves them. Still died for them. Dad Hagen used to tell a story about a, a, a man that married his sister, actually. And um, he ran off on her, left her, abandoned her and the children. And the Lord sent him several times to talk to him about getting right with God. He'd go talk to him. And he'd call, he, he called Brother Hagin Doc. He'd say, Doc, I know you're right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, I know you're right. <clears throat> he said, he's down on the street corner, tears pouring down his face, saying, I know you're right. I need to get right with God, but I'm not going to do anything about it. He said, well, but at least take care of your children. The Bible says a man doesn't take care of his own. It's worse than an infidel. He said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And the woman I'm living with is just, just a slut. She's just a slut. But I'm not going to do anything about it. Here's what they said. They asked him what happened. They said, as he was dying, he died cursing God. Because he probably saw the flames of hell is what it was. But he wouldn't. So how could someone with the knowledge, people have a human spirit, they could make a choice. And they can choose to live according to the flesh or according to the spirit. That's their choice. But nothing separates from the, the love of Christ is still there. The love of Christ is still there. Amen. God loves you. God loves people. And so um, he said here, neither uh, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword will separate us. He goes on and says, we're killed all the day long. We're counted sheep for the slaughter. And then verse 37 he says this, nay, in all these things. Now let, me, let me say something. If you will not serve God, you will not live in victory. Victory does not come to you if you refuse to participate. Amen? Amen. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. When we participate with God, in other words, we're doing, listen, I'm not asking you, saying you're doing everything right. I'm saying when you're participating, because he's saying here, basically, you know, if you mess up, there's, 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 there's answers. If things come against you and you're struggling, there's still answers. Amen. Nay, and all these things are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then he says, for I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank God that there is a victory to the believer even in the midst of difficult circumstances. You don't lose God's love. And, and, let me, let me, and you need to understand that if you really messed up really bad, God doesn't boot you out the front door, the back door, the side door, drop you off a cliff. Thank God. I said, thank God. He's on your side. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 2, Paul once again writing to the church. Verse 14, I love this scripture. Now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ. And what happens? There's a, there's a, there's a qualifier there, in Christ. You get outside of Christ, you don't triumph. Hello? Triumph in Christ that maketh manifest the Savior his knowledge by us in every place. For, unto God, for we are sweet, uh, unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that, per that are saved and in them that are perished. To the one we are the Savior of death unto death and unto the other the Savior of life unto life. Amen. Wow. Thanks be unto God which always causes us a triumph in Christ. 
In other words, when we follow after him, we live according to how he, he designs for us to live, and we do the things he says for us to do. You don't get saved because you, you kept the Ten Commandments. You get saved through believing on Jesus Christ and confessing him as Lord. Believing God's raised from the dead. But I can tell you, victory is lost when you don't walk in him. When you walk in the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But the good, the good news side of that is when you walk in Christ, you walk in victory. Victory is already procured. Victory is already established. Amen? It's kind of like being in a fort. When you're in the fort, there's victory in the fort. You walk outside, you set yourself up as a target. Did you go out there by yourself? Hello? Now, if the whole, if the whole platoon comes, we're just different. But when you just go out there by yourself and do your own thing, you can get in trouble. Amen. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, that's just back a, few, a little bit here, two or three pages back, backwards. Paul once again says this, But thanks be to God, which give us up the victory through. Now, if you understand, he wrote 1 Corinthians first, the 2 Corinthians second. We, I guess you should have read this one first. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, and he always calls us to triumph in Christ. You kind of understand his, his mindset here is that our victory, that our continual victory, that our overcoming victory is through Jesus Christ. You can't take 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 without first reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, and understanding that it's through Christ. In Christ, through Christ. We triumph. We have victory in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the wonderful news for the believer. I can't go out and win it myself anyway. Amen. But as I walk by faith and walk in him and live according to his word and do those things that are pleasing in his sight and live by faith, victory is mine. I said victory is mine. may not feel like it and it may not look like it. Anybody had a day that didn't look like it? may have been the day. You may have had a day today that did not look like victory, but victory is still yours. Amen. I said amen. Hallelujah. I want you to know I have victory over weeds in my garden, in my flower bed. I was out last night because we got a street light right there, and it was cooler, much cooler at, at 10 o'clock last night than it was in the middle of the day. We left and went, you know, to, out to Tulsa to take the girls out, and we're gone nine days or whatever we were gone. We came back, and it looked like somebody had miracle growed the weeds. They weren't there when we left. We come back, and you can't even find the flowers in the flower beds at the front of the street because the weeds have taken over. They're running out in the street. They're running out in the driveway. They're sticking up in the air. And you're like, I, we piled up, me and Nathan, out of that, a wheelbarrow full of grass and, you know, crabgrass and Bermuda, wild Bermuda we pulled out of there. A wheelbarrow. We shook the dirt off. It was just the grass and its roots. Took over the whole thing. Boy, it looks better. <laughs> I'm like, boy, you know, why don't you just round up it? Uh, there's so much there, probably would have sort of the roundup gone on. Roundup's, you know, roundup's good, but you, you know, it, get too much, it gets too much in it, it won't kill it. It'll just keep right on kicking. Hallelujah. I got victory over weeds. Amen. And uh, I got now now that I got it down, Roundup's coming. Stick your uh, ugly little green self up, you're dead. I'll put a gallon on it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Since the victory has been procured by Jesus, since greater is he that's in us than he is in the world, since we overcome by faith, what how, actually how do we do that? Well, let's look at Romans chapter, I mean not Romans, Revelation chapter nine. Chapter 12, verse 9 through 11. Revelations 12, 9 through 11. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they... They overcame the brethren there by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and loved not their lives unto the death. Notice it says here that they overcame by 
the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. See, Jesus' blood has purchased it, but it is the word of our testimony that enforces it. Or makes it applicable to us. Amen. Have you ever gotten like an online shopping code? Go online. You want to buy this product? Now, it's at regular price while you're shopping. While you're getting it all together. Until you get to your inbox and it says, do you have a special code? You plug in that code and hit enter. And all of a sudden the price changes. Now, that price was available the whole time you were shopping. You had the code. But the price stayed its regular price until what? You applied the code. And the moment that it was applied and it entered, you got the price that promised you. Now let me say this. If you were going through there doing that and going, I, I don't believe it. Look at that. That price ain't changed a bit. I, it said if I ordered this online day, I'd get this. Da -da 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 -da, fussing about it and never entered the code, you would have never gotten the price. It was not until you, listen, they'd already guaranteed you the price. There was, a, there was a promise made by the company that if you enter this, you'd get this product at this price. Jesus' blood has already purchased, now it's not a discount, he's purchased the whole thing. And if you enter the code, it was what, what? God's word. Once you use the code, his word, I'm not, I'm not talking about the Bible code, I'm talking about, I'm using a parallel, I'm using an allegory here. Once you enter through your confession the word of God into the circumstance, you've hit enter, then it becomes applicable to your life. And hallelujah. I said, but if you don't do that, it won't work. I said, if you don't do that, it won't work. If you put in the wrong code, it won't work. I just believe. If your code is, I just believe God's going to do it whether I say anything or not, that's the wrong code. It won't work. I said it won't work. Man, we, we got a, um, I got a 26 letter or letter, numerical, whatever, web password on my thing at the house. Well, we had to change routers, so we put it, you know, we used to use it again on the new router, use the same password, because everybody has it in, their, in a file somewhere that we can get to and just cut and paste instead of having to come up with a new one. So, you know, you put it in wrong. I know I put it in right. Put it in wrong, hit enter. Sorry, unable to connect the network. Back over there. Here you go, 26 letters again. Uppercase this, lowercase that, number here, number there. I mean, you know, this sequence of letters and this sequence of numbers and then the mixture of them and their uppercase, whatever it all is. Got to be just right. Try it on an iPhone. It's a lot of fun. Fat thumbs here trying to, you know, I finally just emailed it to myself and cut and pasted it. I got tired of messing with it. Forget this. But you put it in there wrong, it won't work. You come by my house and get 25 of them right, and this one of them, you won't get on my internet. Hello? You have to enter it properly. God's way of applying or accessing what he has provided for you is through the confession of your faith. If you want to live victorious, you're going to have to speak victory. You're not going to be laying in bed singing the hee-haw song and get slapped out of bed and go, Woo, I got the victory. You're going to have to declare your victory. You're going to have to live your victory. You're going to have to talk your victory. Somebody say amen. amen. Or oh me. Amen. So they overcame the blood, the, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. You can't love yourself more than the things of God. I've had people tell me in the past, well, I'll dance if the Lord makes me. You'll never dance before the Lord. When the prophet told the king's chariot, told him, said, said um, 
you better take off because I hear, I, I, I see a cloud the size of man's hands and I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. That chariot took off. Now the prophet, the Bible says, gird up his, gird up his girdle, or, which is, you know, just whatever the clothes, they called it the girdle, but it wasn't, it wasn't Playtex, okay? It was, it was another form of dress, okay? It wasn't, it wasn't you know, Playtex, Playtex 18-hour girdle. You, know, you don't hear these commercials anymore, do you? You know? Hallelujah. And, uh, but he, gird, he gathered up, I understand men wore robes, yeah. they wear pants, okay? I remember people used to come to me, you can't, woman can't wear pants. Wow, that's what pertains to a man. I said, the guy that wrote it was wearing a dress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so get your stuff straight, guys. But he girded up, his, he, he grabbed up the, 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 the robe he was wearing, the, uh, the girdle, and took off running. If you stay that, it says the hand of the Lord came on him and did outrun the king's chariot. Now, I don't care if it was Clyde, the mule running, he outran it. Now, you know the king had the best horses in the kingdom. I'm just saying, you outrun a mule that's running. It's going to be tough. You might out sprint him for 200 yards, but you're going to run out of wind. Amen. Amen. Well, what happened? The hand of the Lord on him didn't come on him, and then he girded up his girdle and took off running. His girdle took off running. He took off running, and the hand of the Lord came on him. See, we're, we're too often waiting for God to do something before we respond instead of going ahead and responding and then God doing something. Hello? We want, we want some supernatural something or another to hit us and make us do something. Instead of just going ahead and going with going the program and then God coming on you. Amen? Yeah. You're going to have. So, so a, lot, a lot of people are embarrassed. Ah, I'll be embarrassed to dance in front of the church. I had one person one time. I tried did everything I could. I knew the Lord wanted to do something for me special in the spirit. And, and, and that, no, and let's, you know, unless God makes me, I'm not going to do it. Well, you just stand there like a knot on a log then, bozo. You ain't going to get anything. And I'm not going to stand here and waste my time trying to convince you to do something when you're being hard-headed and obstinate, like a mule. Hello? You ever worked in the tobacco fields? You'll know mules can be some stubborn trucking with a mule. I mean, you're sitting there trying to get them to take the tobacco to the barn. They won't. No, they decide they're going to eat corn in the field next door. And they just ain't going to move. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. I mean, you can go and beat them, they're going to stand, right? That's why that, that's why that I, I'm stubborn as a mule came from. It wasn't because they weren't stubborn. They are stubborn. You can get and pull on the harness, do everything you want to. If they decide they ain't moving, don't be like that as a Christian. Amen. Don't love. Now, I know this could be talking about not, you know, not loving the life under death and the persecution stuff, but also I'm going to tell you something. You know, the, the fear of being uh, ridiculed or whatever because you responded to God, you can't love your life. You just got to go on. Just, you've got to be dead yeah. and alive under God. And you just got to be dead to yourself and go on if you want to have victory. Amen? Revelation, I'm sorry, uh, Re Hebrews 9, verse 11. Hebrews 9, 11. Going down through verse 22, says, But Christ, being a good priest, a high priest, I'm sorry, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having or, uh, obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. I hate reading this, just reading. I love to preach this. <laughs> I just, I get here, I want, I want to stop, hallelujah, and I want to stand up and start running, hallelujah, but we're going to teach it, hallelujah. Sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the new covenant or new testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressors that were under the first covenant or testament they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. For where a testament or covenant is there must also be a necessity the death of the testator or covenant maker. 
for a testament is a force after men. Uh, you know, you could say will here, actually. I'm talking about will. This is talking about last will and testament. You know, kind of the same terminology. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. In other words, you know, if, if my mom and dad say and write out a, a last will and testament and say when we pass away, you know, my, my children divide our property up equally among the four of them, yada, 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 yada. I can't go in there and take a fourth. Why? They're still breathing. I can't do it. And well, you put me in your will. Well, I mean anything. It doesn't mean doodly squat while they're breathing. Yeah. As long as there's air in their lungs, that will don't, testament don't mean anything. Why? They can change their mind and change it. They can go burn that one and change it and create a new one because they're still alive. And as long as they're alive, they can change their will. They can change their mind. So it doesn't come a force until they die. Now, once they die, it becomes a force. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet and wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Now, under that, under the Old Testament, I used the blood of animals to put it into force. Okay. Moreover, he sprinkled the blood in the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, hallelujah, there is no remission. All right. So we find out here that Christ became a high, the high priest of good things by his own blood. So when he died, the covenant, the new covenant of God came into force, ratified by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. Hath he said, he shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall not make it good? Oh, hallelujah. Now that's shouting grounds, church. What has God said in his word that he's going to make good and not, and not also do? Says he's not a man that he should lie. He can't go, well, you know, I, know I promise you in First Peter 2, 24 that, you know, that by his stripes you were healed. But you know what? I changed my mind. I don't heal anymore. I decided to take, I've, actually, I've changed course, and I now make people sick. I think sickness is a good teacher instead of healing people and showing them my goodness. Sickness is a great teacher, and so I don't do that healing thing anymore. I just, I'm the one that's making people sick. Now, I know that my son said that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and that he came to give life and to give it to the full. But you know what? I changed my mind. Well, that's why I got the number says this. God's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent and have a change of mind. Change in the way he does things. And he says this. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Wow. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Look at the next one. Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Ooh, glory. I said, woo, glory. Hallelujah. Ho, 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 ho. Woo. And then notice the, the, the preface the, 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 uh, by, the, by the Spirit of God. This was prefaced. Well, let's go to Numbers 23. I want you to see it in your Bible. That's Old Testament. Oh, shut up. And that's, that's not real nice. I get tired of people disqualifying everybody from everything they don't agree with by trying to find out some, some way to disqualify. I love the people who quote certain scriptures and they go, well, that's the Old Testament. And then when you bring up that, certain things to their crazy doctrines, they go, that's the Old Testament. It's, it's not a pick and choose. Now, the things that were eradicated, you know, the Bible says the curse of the law, so the law and the Old Covenant is no longer applicable to us. But the blessings of the Old Testament are. Actually, we're redeemed from the curse of the law, not the blessings of it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Numbers 23. And he brought him into the field of Zephim, verse 14, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars, and offered a bullock and a ram, and said unto Balak, Stand here by, burnt, uh, by the burnt offering while I meet the Lord yonder. And the Lord met Balaam, and put a word in his mouth, and said, Go again unto Balak, and say thus. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering, and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable, and said, Rise up, Balak, here, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. 
He's speaking by inspiration of the Holy Ghost something God said. And listen to what he says. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall not make it good? Behold, I have received command to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot, I cannot, I cannot reverse it. <laughs> Woo, glory. That's double shouting ground. When God declared blessing, he cannot reverse it. Are you here? Amen? In other words, what, they, what, um, what, the, what they want to do is have Balaam come curse Israel. But he put a word in Balak's mouth. I mean, uh, yeah. Let's see here. Make sure I get in my style. I won't get this wrong now. Yeah, Balaam is talking to Balak. Balak's trying to pay him to curse Israel. And he gets there. I, the, the thing about the Old Testament prophets, they were, they were in and out of the flesh right and left. One minute he's trying to curse. The next minute the Holy Ghost comes on him. He goes, I can't curse him. God can't reverse his blessing. Had, uh, Dad Hagen used to tell a story about a man that, that, um, that was had backslidden and got in church, backslidden, finally backslidden, and just and so backslidden. Came in church one day, they were sitting there, and the power of God was in the building, and they were just all sitting there quiet in the presence of God. Man came and sat down, stood up, spoke in tongues, and interpreted and cursed his own self. Said, you know, because he wouldn't repent, this was going to happen to him, and that happened to him. Prophesied his own, his own destruction. He had flowed in the gifts of the Spirit at one time. And his last, his last place in the Spirit was to prophesy his own destruction. I don't believe that. I don't care what you believe. You just can't deny stuff because you don't like it. I, I, I should be kinder and more gentle. I should be a kinder, gentler pastor. It's not imperative. It's, it's imperative you understand that what you believe outside the Bible and the things of God is irrelevant. Yes. Which, when I said, I don't care what you believe is what I'm saying. All right. Notice that when he, he got up there, he said, the Israel's already blessed. And he says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. Hath he said it, shall he not do it? The blessing already been pronounced. Hath he spoken it, shall he not make a good? Behold, I received commandment to bless, and he blessed, and I cannot. The prophet said, I can't reverse it. God's already blessed the church. It is not up to God to bring cursing on you. Now, you can get yourself cursed by saying the wrong things and getting out there and doing them. In other words, getting out from under the blessing. But God's not going to change his mind, and God's not going to do something different. He's still trying to bless. You got people walking in destruction, and the whole time God's trying to bless, got the blessing waiting for them, they'll just get back over here and, and, and get out of where and get back to where they're supposed to be. Because the blessing's here, they're walking over here. And what led them over there? Their mouth. Oh, how, how can your mouth lead you over there? Look over here in James. I'm going to tell you something. James makes a real interesting, uh, he uses a couple of examples in reference to the tongue that let us know the tongue guides us where we go. Yeah. Look at chapter 3. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word... The same as the perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Whoa, okay, now the tongue, word, your bowels, your word is what? Your guide. Why? You can control it, you control the whole body. He says bridle the whole body. 
Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths, and they, that they may obey us, we turn their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, in other words, these are, these are parallels, or these are allegories of how powerful the tongue is, or what the tongue actually does. A bit in the horse's mouth controls the horse. The helm controls what? The ship. Even so, or likewise, and in the same manner, the tongue is a little member. And boasteth great things, behold, great a matter, a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and serpents, and things of the sea is tamed, and can't, hath been tamed by mankind. But the tongue can no man tame, is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therefore we bless we God, even the Father, therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brother. These things ought not to be so. Doth the fountain send forth at the same time, same place, sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive trees, either a vine figs? So no can so, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and do with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good lifestyle his works with meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom to send the we'll just we'll forget that. We don't need that. Yeah. The tongue, you can't tame the tongue with your thoughts. I'm just not going to say that. You've heard people do it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. And all of a sudden they say, I just had to say it. Some of y'all remember clinic, John Wayne. Pilgrim, you caused a lot of trouble here today. And someone ought to belt you one. I won't. I won't. The I won't. And punches the guy out. That's how your tongue is. Yeah. If you do, how do we control our, our tongue? The Bible makes a very, Jesus made a very, very interesting statement. I don't have it here in my notes because we're, we're way off my notes right this second. He said this. He said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil things. Amen. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Your mouth is G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. It's also B-I-B-O. Bible in, Bible out. If you put the Bible in in abundance, you get the Bible back out. How do you control your tongue? By what you put in you, by what you feed on, by what you meditate on. When you meditate on the Word, and you feed on the Word. That's why we're to be... be uh, what, now, what did James 1, 8... Can you see the, the, the connection here to John, uh, Joshua 1, 8? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. The word meditate means to mutter there. It means to mutter it. Mean, that thou shalt meditate there in day and night, that thou mayest observe... And turn over there. Look in your Bibles. I'm trying to quote it and run ahead. You need to see this in your Bible. Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. How many are there? How many are not there? Raise your hand. I'll give you time to get there. It's right after Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. So fine. I'm blessed in the city and the country too. That's a Lynn Meek song. Blessed in everything I put my hand to. All right, anyway. How many, how many, everybody there now? All right, how many's not there? Anybody not there? All right, here we go. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate and mutter therein day and night. That, that, why? Why are you going to keep speaking it? Meditating on it. That thou mayest observe to do. You understand, if you're going to have faith for victory, you're going to have to put victory things in. So you speak, why? Because you're overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You're going to have to talk victory. You cannot talk defeat and expect to get victory. Remember what we said Sunday morning? God's word is God's seed. You, every seed produces after its own kind. You speak defeat, you get defeat harvest. You cannot plant collard seeds and get green beans. I don't care what you go confess over your garden. 
Hello? Why? Because the seed was collard seed. And in that collard seed is collard plant. Hello? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Listen to what he says here. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success or deal wisely in the affairs of life. What connects the people of God to the promises of God and their enforcement or application to their life? Well, how do we get it here? By putting it in your spirits. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now listen, we're not talking about exercises where somebody says, what's your confession today? And you've memorized, you know, uh, Wednesday's confession from some devotional. That's not abundance. That's memorization. Now let me ask you, I'm going to tell you something. Go talk to Nathan and ask him the, the chemical formula for something in chemistry. He won't be able to tell you. He may have learned it. When he's taking, I'm sorry, sorry, folks. He may have learned that taking chemistry. He may have learned, you know, uh, Pelagram's, uh, Pelagram's theorem. The Pelagory. Uh, no. <laughs> well, you can tell us in my heart in abundance. Pelagory. Pelagory. Uh, 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 the, the P theorem. All right. <laughs> you may. Was that A squared plus B squared equals C squared? There you go. C, equals, C squared equals the square root of A squared plus B squared. All right. There you go. I can't even remember how, you know, I've heard it. You may ask him that. If you ask him what a C chord looks like on a guitar. Yeah. <laughs> Why? You can have C sus, C7, G. You can ask him all kinds of things. Just, 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 why? It's in an abundance. It's not just memorized to pass a test on something. It's, it's in an abundance. He just puts it in there all the time. And he keeps building on that learning. So send him in abundance. That math stuff, he's going to have to learn it all over again when he takes it in college. Because it was only in there long enough to get through the test. He didn't care about it. Wasn't interested in it. He was only putting it up here in short-term memory just to make it through the test. He didn't care. How did somebody got all the hallelujahs going on? You non-math people are going to say, oh, yes, amen. I'm telling you. There you have it. Abundance or not is a difference. If you simply recite, and understand this, I understand mem memorizing for the purpose of feeding on it, that's okay. But if you're simply memorizing the thing, it's going to work just because you memorize it. Jesus said out of the, out of the abundance. Well, how do we know the difference? Now, I, here, we, we did some stuff. With we would sit with Nathan and study with him for a test. And just sitting there, he could quote it back to you, get to the test and forget it. Why? Pressure. The difference of sitting at home and the difference of having to do it on the test, he'd get confused and, 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 and get, get whatever, and there was pressure. You had to get it right. When the pressure of life comes on you, just because you memorize something, it's not going to come out. You're going to get it all mixed up like Eve did. God didn't say a thing about not touching the fruit. He just said you don't eat of it. Best I can tell is she got all messed up. He said they were supposed to be tent, tent, tr uh, tending the garden, taking care of it. They're supposed to be taking care of the fruit, just not eat it. She, and then she threw in something extra, got it all messed up. Hello. Y'all here, you're going home. But he says here that when you meditate in it day and night, and, it gets, and then Jesus said if it gets into your heart in abundance, what's going to happen? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. When the pressure comes, that's what's going to come out. And then the, what, that which the blood of the Lamb purchased is now activated because pressure came and you spoke out of the abundance of your heart what the Word says. Because you believed it. You're, that's what you believe. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. But what saith that the Word is now that even in thy mouth and in thy heart the Word of faith which we preach. We just preach grace. Now, I'm sorry, it's called the Word of Faith, too. I believe in grace. Thank God for grace. Oh, thank God for grace. And Paul also called it the Word of Faith. Amen. We activate, we make applicable to our lives, we enter into the benefit of 
the promises of God that were procured by the blood of Jesus through the confession of our faith, which is why the, the John wrote in the book of Revelation, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. See, Jesus purchased it. There's always a God we're side and the men would side. Jesus purchased it with his blood and was activated, made real and applied by the word, the, 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 con, by, by their uh, word, of word of their testimony. I want to say confession. That's not what I was, I was like. Okay, it's not the right word. And the word of their testimony. That's their confession. God's side, purchased by Jesus. Man's side, declaring it. How did we get to the place that we can declare it? Feed on it. Got into us in abundance. When got into us in abundance, that's when it comes out. Amen. So we become overcomers through our faith. Our faith, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. What is the faith in? Things that Jesus purchased by His blood. So it's not just abstract faith. It's faith in something real. And it's in the faith of all that Jesus purchased with His blood. Peter says something really interesting. He said, Wherefore give unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Thank God there are prom exceeding great and precious promises made. Amen? But we take those promises and make them real by the word of our testimony. Amen. Amen. Praise God.